the desert sun, focused beyond the boiling point to make electricity. In this solar power plant, it's all done with mirrors. Three quarters of the known universe is hydrogen, but just a little in a fuel cell takes this ride a long way. Ever feel like you're just a small cog in a big machine? Well, hop on the escalator and join the crowd. 3,000 needle stabs a minute. If you're not cringing yet, wait till you meet the tattoo gun. Let's take the lid off these machines and see how they work. There are a lot of ways to harness the sun's power. Like with a magnifying glass or a curved mirror. Both of which can concentrate sunlight into intense heat. And that's exactly what inspired the creators of the Solar One to build a low emission power plant out here in Nevada's Mojave Desert. Let's see how it works. In a desert where the sun shines 300 days a year, 200,000 mirrors side by side, row on row, form hundreds of parabolic troughs, reflecting sunlight with a surface area of about 50 football fields. That makes enough electricity to keep the power on in 14,000 homes year round. So yeah, we're talking solar here but not the pricey silicon cells that run our calculators. At this scale, that would cost a fortune. This is sunlight concentrated 70 times its normal strength, hot enough to burn your skin instantly. But here, it's focused on heating oil inside these tubes. And that hot oil is harnessed to boil water which makes steam that drives a turbine, which makes electricity. Simple, right? Well, before you go out and build one, there are a few problems to overcome on a solar power plant like this. Number one, regular mirrors at home don't reflect nearly enough light to do the job. Two, your mirror has to move all day. The sun, uh, that is the Earth, won't sit still. And finally, what do you do with a solar plant at night? Okay, first challenge, the mirrors. Household mirrors are fine for touch-ups, but are backed with a cheap spray-on coating that absorbs a lot of light. Pricey laboratory mirrors use silver coatings that reflect most of the light that hits them. And the ones here take it up another notch, reflecting almost 100% of the light that strikes them. To heat things up even more, they're curved. This concentrates the light onto the oil tubes that sit perfectly at their focal point. Focusing light is one thing. Putting it to work, another. So engineers clad the oil tubes in a special glass that intensifies the sun's rays even more. By the time the hot oil travels through nearly 20 kilometers of tubing, it's four times hotter than the boiling point of water. That's twice as hot as the oil used to make fries. The oil's now pumped into the guts of the plant and is ready to boil water. Oil tubes run down the center of these water pipes. The water absorbs heat from the oil, turns to steam, and heads straight to the machine's generating station. All of the electricity from this power plant is produced with conventional steam turbines. 
steam drives the blades, which spin a generator, which delivers electricity to the local grid. Once the steam has fueled the turbine blades, it cools down and loses its, well, steam. It's not hot enough to drive anything, but it's still vapor. It's got to cool down before it can be used again. So it heads to a rain room, where steam is trapped, condensed, and returned to the system. The second challenge for this machine is to follow the sun's arc. Sunflowers have to move all day in order to capture the sun's energy. If these mirrors were stuck in one place like a traditional solar panel, they would only reach their maximum potential for a few minutes a day. So, electric motors are placed within groups of mirrors that allow them to follow the sun's arc. On to the third challenge. What happens after sundown? No sun, no power. There are plans for thermal storage tanks filled with heat-trapping molten salts, but they're still on the drawing board. So at night, the Solar One switches to this natural gas burner to keep the turbine spinning. Good thing that demand for electricity peaks during the day. And that's when this machine delivers. And boy, does it deliver. 60 megawatts of power with almost no emissions, preventing 20,000 cars worth of CO2 from entering the atmosphere every year. The Solar One, a giant machine with a small footprint, capturing energy from the sun. It's no magic trick, but it is done with mirrors and no smoke. This motorcycle is powered by hydrogen, the simplest and most plentiful element in the known universe. Its creators called this bike Envy, short for Emissions Neutral Vehicle. And you can make a cup of tea from the only thing that comes out of its exhaust. You guessed it, water. And what makes the NV go? Is this mini power plant called a fuel cell, which produces enough electricity to keep the bike rolling. Not bad for a machine that can hit 80 kilometers an hour. Okay, so it's not exactly a rocket, but it is fueled by rocket science. The first practical fuel cell system was developed by NASA in the early 60s to generate electricity in space capsules. A good way to understand fuel cells is to see how hydrogen is produced, and it's actually pretty simple. Fill a container with water and run an electric current through it. This splits hydrogen and oxygen from the water molecule and the process is called electrolysis. This is the science behind producing hydrogen gas. Now, if you reverse that process and figure out how to rejoin hydrogen and oxygen, you'll create electrical energy along with water and a little heat. But it's not a fuel cell yet you need to figure out how to harness its electrical energy. And to power this bike, it needs to be compact and portable. Here's how it works. These vents near the handlebars stream outside air to the fuel cell. The attraction between oxygen and hydrogen helps the fuel cell produce electricity. And that's all about electrons. 
Electricity is simply a flow of electrons. A fuel cell's primary function is to liberate them. Hydrogen enters the fuel cell on the left, oxygen on the right. A platinum film strips electrons in yellow from the hydrogen, leaving behind protons. Both are attracted to the oxygen on the other side, but electrons are stopped by this membrane. They now need to find their way back to the protons. The only way out is along wires to an electric motor that spins a drive belt and gear on the back wheel. After passing through the motor, the electrons find their way to the other side of the fuel cell. As they meet up with protons and oxygen, they form H2O, a chemical soup known as water. That's the only emission this fuel cell belches out. And save the jokes about this having a sewing machine engine, because this puppy could power 60 of them. OK, the ENV is powered up. How do you keep it going? Simple. A fuel cell will go on forever, so long as it has a source of hydrogen. When the fuel cell runs out, all it needs is a fill-up. And there's a ready supply of it here, at Leftborough University in England, where this prototype was born. Filling up a fuel cell is as exciting as topping up the gas tank in your car. Minus the fumes. And unlike a conventional motorcycle, the only sound you'll hear from this machine is the rubber on the road. We're still a few years away from hydrogen-powered vehicles in the local parking lot. But when we get there, you may have your own personal fuel cell to power or charge just about anything, anywhere. And oh yeah, a motorbike too. This is the great cattle drive. Day in, day out. Over and over again. In some office somewhere, flow dynamics experts study our patterns to get us onto a machine. That's basically a tricked out set of stairs on a conveyor belt. So how does it work? Escalators not only get us upstairs, they process crowds without damaging the goods. Today's escalator designers have three major challenges. Keep it running smooth, quiet, and safe. Powering a busy escalator is like pulling a fully loaded SUV up a 30-degree hill. But under this machine, there's nothing but a puny 10 horsepower motor. How is that possible? Sure, it spins fast, but there's no way it can drive a fully loaded escalator. It was installed because it's whisper quiet. And that's important if you want people to use them in public spaces. Going with a larger direct drive motor would make way too much noise. So to generate enough power, this little guy needs a gearbox. The gearbox steps down the motor's RPM, and that translates into increased horsepower to the larger drive gear. And when you tow anything up a hill, power is always better than speed. But this is also a powerful, potentially deadly machine and fatal accidents still occur around the world on a regular basis. Tumble into one of these, and you may as well fall into the jaws of a shark. And that's no joke. Escalator accidents kill more people per year than sharks. So when it comes to safety, designers look at every inch of the escalator, especially at the two trickiest parts of the ride, how you step on and off the machine. To make life easier, they came up with the level-loading platform. 
This design feature remains flat for the first few steps as you walk on and gives you a moment to adjust before the step beneath you rises. Some early escalator models force patrons to jump onto the first rising step. Not exactly the challenge you're looking for at a shopping mall. Each step has upper and lower wheels on its ends, which fit into two sets of tracks. The upper set of wheels join together to form parallel chains in a continuous loop. This chain of wheels fits into a cog of the main drive gear and into notches in the main drive wheel. The steps rise and stay level through the ride at one to three kilometers per hour, then collapse to let you off. While riding, you hang on to flexible handrails. They have their own rollers and their own path, but are driven by the same drive mechanism as the steps, so they stay perfectly in sync. Other welcome design features on this machine are the comb plate and the step grooves at the end of the run. They work together to keep loose shoelaces, debris, and curious little fingers from getting caught. And if the handrail ever goes out of sync, if anything gets jammed or slows it down, or if the impact sensors in the comb plate sense anything wrong, the brakes will bring everything to a safe stop. The escalator first appeared as an amusement park ride in 1896. Today, they give over 90 billion rides a year in North America alone. And the only time we ever notice them is when they break down and we haul ourselves and our assets all the way to the next floor. Tattoos have been around for thousands of years. And they've never been more popular. One in eight American adults have at least one tattoo. That's 40 million people. Which is pretty crazy when you realize how much it hurts to get one. And well, they're kind of permanent. It's a mechanical rattlesnake that spits ink instead of venom. So how does this machine work? On the surface, tattoo machines are pretty basic. You can build one using a motor from a hairdryer or a vibrating toothbrush with guitar strings and erasers. And your ink can be taken from a simple ballpoint pen. Or you can sharpen a stick put dye on the end and poke holes in your skin. Just don't go trying any of this at home. All you have to do to make a tattoo is puncture the epidermis or outer layer of skin and deposit color into the dermis or second layer of skin, about one millimeter below the surface. And this machine does it up to 50 times a second which means for every minute in the chair, you're getting stabbed 3,000 times. And if it takes up to three hours to create one, that's 540,000 punctures. Ouch. Then there's the problem of accuracy. You can't make detailed art like this without micro precision. The tattoo machine controls needle depth, speed, and application to within a fraction of a millimeter. It hurts like a dental drill, sounds like a dental drill, and is as precise as a dental drill. It starts with a bunch of parts and one elastic, divided into three main sections, the base, the mechanism, and the needle. The business end is, of course, the needle. It's soldered to a metal arm that connects to the armature bar, the part that does all the work going up and down. 
A spring connects the armature bar to the base, the hunk of metal that looks like a rabbit ear with a screw in it. And the elastic? It keeps the hyper-fast needle from going off track. No coloring outside the lines here. The tattoo machine is armed with razor-sharp stainless steel, not tipped with a simple sewing machine needle. Modern tattoo needles come in a wide array of designs. They may look medieval, but are created to deal with some amazingly intricate and, well, special requests. The needles make tiny successive holes in the skin. Picture a sewing machine working through fabric. The ink is deposited into skin just like the thread that creates a stitch. The skin has to be stretched tight during the process. If left loose, the needles get stuck, the ink bleeds out and makes a mess. Let's see how it works on a new design. It begins with an outline. In order to trace it, the machine is set up to draw a fine line. So it's loaded with a needle that's round like the tip of a pencil. After the outline is complete, it's time for shading. So the machine needs a new set of teeth. Shading needles are configured like a comb. The more needles in a configuration, the more ink is transferred. The multiple needles create matching holes that are filled at the same time. The needles get up to speed by harnessing electromagnetism. And that's controlled by this power supply. A foot pedal turns the juice on and off. This drives the machine at rates of over 4,000 revolutions per minute. A sports car can hit 150 kilometers an hour at the same RPM. Power travels along cables to these coils and creates a magnetic field. This pulls down the armature bar and forces the needle into the skin. As soon as the armature bar hits the coils, it breaks the electrical circuit. The magnet turns off, and this spring snaps the bar back up. As soon as it hits this contact, the magnet is reactivated and the needle is driven down again. The rate of the needle in this machine is so fast, it matches the wing speed of a hummingbird. But birds' wings do not cause sharp, burning pain. In a world where everything is disposable, these works of art are for keeps. Whether for social prestige, spiritual devotion, tribal rite of passage, or a momentary lapse of reason, Tattoos are the ultimate visual sacrifice for personal expression. This machine has taken an ancient art form and made it perfect with a little modern know-how. <laughs>